Today, I am speaking with Diana Graber. Welcome, Diana. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show to talk about how we can keep our kids safe online and really learn to deal with the online world in a way that works best for them and for us. And I think the best way to kick things off is have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Okay, sure. Well, I'm the author of a book called um, Raising Humans in a Digital World, Helping Kids Build a Healthy Relationship with Technology. And uh, that pretty much sums up what I do or what my passion is these days. In addition to that, I'm the founder of two companies. The first one, Cyber Civics, provides digital literacy curriculum to schools. And the second, CyberWise, is a resource site for parents of digital kids. Very nice. And I, what I appreciate is that your focus is very similar to ours in a different domain. And that yeah. is engaging kids, you know, and empowering parents. I want to know, how can we be more intentional about raising our kids with technology in ways that are developmentally appropriate so that they can have a healthy relationship with technology kind of going forward. Right. Well, I think you used the exact right word there, developmentally appropriate. That is so much at the core of what we can do to help our kids use technology well. I mean, as we both know, kids are handed cell phones so young these days. And, you know, you're handing them a connection to the whole world and all the people in it, right? And this is usually before a kid's brain is even able to make decisions or know the consequences of their acts. So I think the longer you can delay that and the more education you can give a child before you hand them this device, the better outcome for everybody. Yeah. There does seem to be much more of an awareness uh, amongst parents uh, about the importance of delaying this and if not the technology, at least the adoption of, say, social media. But why don't you lay out what are the real dangers for young kids using technology early? Well, gosh, you know, it's funny that you say an awareness because I think there's more awareness of parents, but there's still you know, so many kids that sign up for social media before age 13, because social media companies make it so darn easy to do. You know, a nine-year-old's pretty good at math when they need to make sure that they pick a birth date that makes them 13. So all of a sudden they become a math genius, right? So (laughs) we haven't solved that problem yet. Um, But when we do have kids wait a little bit longer, you know, I mean, we know from eons of research on kids' brains that it takes about 12 to 13 years of life before they can develop abstract thinking skills and abstract thinking is, you know, the prerequisite to ethical thinking and nearly everything you do online requires the ability to engage in ethical thinking. So, I mean, just think about it like cyberbullying, being mean to somebody or sharing a picture that's going to hurt somebody's feelings. All of those things require a higher order of thinking that, you know, a a nine-year-old just does not have. So I just think, You know, we get mad at kids at that age when they make a mistake online and it's really not their fault. They're just not ready. Yeah. I guess what I mean about the awareness is I'm sure you're familiar with Jonathan Haidt's book, The Anxious Mm -hmm. Generation. I haven't haven't read the book, but I listened to him on podcasts and I've noticed uh, my kids are now in college, but he has my one of my brothers has younger kids and their school is putting there's a ban on the cell phones in the school Mm -hmm. and there's he's not the only person that has mentioned that. And so there does seem to be this awareness that's bubbling up. And I think a lot of it is probably coming from, you know, your work (laughs) over time that's, that's being made, that's driving this kind of awareness. But one thing I would love for you to go into a little bit, can you go deeper on this ethical thinking concept? I think that would be useful to know a little bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, my background's in developmental psychology, and I, I think that's what's so interesting about thinking about kids and how they use things online. And, you know, I I go back to when I see problems with kids that are young, like maybe they'll do a TikTok challenge that's mean or dangerous or unsafe, or they'll post a picture of a friend that's really unflattering and hurts that friend's feelings. Well, again, that requires like thinking, like what are the consequences of my actions? (laughs) And is this an ethical thing to do? And all that stuff, it's really hard to think that way. I mean, some people are never able to think that way, but certainly for a nine, 10 or 11 year old, you know, they're just not there yet. They don't know the consequences of their actions. Everything's in terms of how it affects them. And it's really hard for them to think about how it impacts another person. And then when you want to get into the thinking about, you know, there's other parts of the brain that people say it takes till age 25 to develop. So of course, we're not going to hold off technology till then. But if we can at least do it till 12 or 13, I think we do our our kids a great service. Yeah. And I think you're, uh, you're right to 
when you talk about the social media companies, the thing that we really need is actual age getting that works. Yeah. Um, but it is this kind of collective action program and it's going to require all parents to, it just requires uh, more than just, because you can't be the only parent or a minor, a small minority parent uh, right. trying to make that happen. Because I know, you know, this happened with our kids is like, they will say, and maybe rightfully so that it's going to affect their social lives. And how do you address that in a way that's effective if there are so many people that are allowing their kids to go on social media way younger than they should be on there, if, if not, not, not just social media, but have phones. Um, but on the other side, I, you know, there's a beauty of technology. I wanna, I'd, I'd like to have you kind of compliment the dangers of technologies. What are the good things that we feel that are happening online for kids? Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of good things. And I hope, you know, I, kind of my, my thing is I don't like to focus on the dangers because I think they're easily dealt with. And one of, one of the ways is to delay a little bit, but the most important way is to educate. And that's really what we're all about. That's why we developed cyber civics, which is our in-school curriculum, teaching kids digital literacy so that when they do get the tools, they know all the pitfalls and they're prepared to use them well. It's so simple. And, and really what drives me crazy is honestly reading about all these cell phone bans or banning social media, ban, ban, ban. I mean, come on, people. We know bans do not work unless they go hand in hand with educating because you cannot ban the cell phone from the face of the planet. It's not going to happen. So if we want our kids to use these well, we have to teach them digital literacy, like financial literacy. you got to know the skills. you got to know how to use these things well before you get them in your hand. And then Oh my gosh, there's so many things they can do. Like they are great research tools, great way to connect with people if you want to learn new things, great way to go on YouTube and discover interests that you didn't even know you had. I mean, the list is endless. So let's open those opportunities for our kids, but do it in a way that's going to keep them safe. Well, good. I appreciate you uh, talking about all the, uh, the wonderful things that yeah. uh, technology has to offer. One concept, though, that comes up a lot is, and I was just listening to a podcast today about this idea that, uh, you know, things are free online, right? But they're not really free, right? We're paying them, pay, we're, kids are paying for it, we're, we're paying with whatever it is, whether we're paying for it with privacy, uh, data, any of that. How do we teach our kids that free online has a price? You know, once, once we've made that decision that they're going to use technology, how do we get yeah. that across to them? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's what we teach them, that nothing online is free. You pay for it with your personal information. So we have a whole series of lessons on personal information and what companies do with it. I mean, there are so many lessons, you know, from one where we kind of trick them and say, oh, we're going to have people spying on you in school. And how do you feel about that? And they're like, we hate that. We're like, oh, really? Well, that's what happens online. <laughs> so we, we start <laughs> that way. And then we have a series of lessons where we have them read the privacy policies. Um, this year, they're reading TikTok and Snapchat. And I love doing that because, you know, it's long and it's boring, but we teach them the vocabulary first and then we give them the long terms and they do it in teams. So every team has a page to, that they have to look for the terms they just used and then they have to discuss it in their teams. And the beauty of doing that is they come back to me. They're like, oh, Mrs. Graver, you would not believe what Snapchat does. Like they never get rid of this stuff. They keep all the pictures or you wouldn't believe what TikTok does. They do biometrics. Do you know what that is? And so when they <laughs> like it empowers them with knowledge to be mad, you know, it's like what? And then from there, we can move into lessons on, you know, what a filter bubble is like, okay, now that they know all this about you, guess what they're doing? They're deciding what you like and like what 13 year old wants an adult telling them what they like, <laughs> not one. So again, like you're tapping into that developmental vulnerability and curiosity. And that really turns them on to being more aware of like, what am I giving away online? I'm going to be a lot more careful about it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because Erin uh, McNeil, who I interviewed, and, and she's the one who connected us, uh, and she's her focus is on media literacy, yeah. was saying that, uh, you know, kids really love having these conversations because they oh. find out, yeah, they find out they're being manipulated and they're not don't love being manipulated, but they love finding out how they can avoid being manipulated. So you're kind of introducing them to something that really is going to pay off for them in the long run. I think that's it's really wonderful. I, I, I have a question. So 
if I'm a parent listening right now and I'm thinking, well, you know, how do I get this into a classroom that my kid has? Or if I can't do that, what can I do by myself as a parent to try to get this information across to my kids? Well, I love that question because I think every parent in America should make sure their school is teaching digital or media literacy. A lot of states now, as Aaron probably told you, require it. There's laws on the books that say kids have to get these lessons, but yet a lot of them are not. So I tell parents all the time, you want your kids to be smart online and use technology well, pick up the phone and call your school principal and say, are you teaching this to my kids? And if not, why not? That's number one. So many, so many of the schools that use cyber civics, it happened because of one parent, one parent saying, look, at this is, we, we can't do this without our kids learning this. And I would say, you know, parents can teach this at home. We have, we offer it for homeschoolers too, but it's way more effective in a classroom. It's hard for parents to teach this because there's a lot to it. And a lot of parents didn't really grow up with digital literacy. So it's easier to do it with peers. And those lessons I quickly described to you, the reason they work so well is because kids are talking about it amongst each other. And that that does a couple things. I mean, first of all, they love it because it's their everyday life. You know, who doesn't want to talk about the stuff they do on their cell phones, right? They think they're experts. Yeah. But secondly, a lot of kids are dealing with stuff, like whether it be cyberbullying, digital drama, hate speech, sextortion. I mean, there's a lot. And this is where it comes out. Like we talk about it in the classroom, they compare notes, they help each other, they watch out for each other. They create those norms in person that they then take into their online world. So it's just, it's a no brainer to teach this stuff. And you know, the third thing I will say about it, it's literacy. <laughs> you know, We teach our kids, we tell our kids, we want them to go to school to be literate. Digital literacy is today's literacy. So it's just incumbent upon our educational system to provide this for students. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we, we talk about financial literacy, right. we've had talked about media literacy and tech literacy. I mean, these really are the things our kids need to learn. I am curious, how do you, cause you were talking about, you know, kids getting online and they're, they're, they're creating an online persona. So how do we help kids craft a positive online reputation? Because we know it's going to kind of anything they're doing is going to, kind of stick with them, yeah. and, which seems really unfair for you know, when I think back at you know what I was like when I was 13, 14, and 15, but it is reality. So how do we help yeah. them craft that positive well, online reputation? Again, those are a series of lessons we have. You know, what is a digital reputation? And everything you do online stays online forever and can be seen by everybody, you know? And so we show them how that happens. It's not just what they post about themselves, but in a lot of cases, it's what their parents and grandparents have already posted about them. I hear a lot about that because that's, that contributes to a child's reputation. And, you know, usually kids preteen, they're really, you know, sensitive about how they appear to others. And so for them, a lot of that's cringy and it's hard for them to, you know, walk away from it. So there's that. And then on top of that, like when kids post pictures of one another and tag each other, they're contributing to each other's reputation. So a lot of times if they post something that they might be sarcastic or they think it's funny, it could be damaging to their friend's reputation. So all of these are a series of lessons that we take them through. We play games and do activities so they can understand how, how impactful a reputation is. For example, in one of our lessons, they pretend to be college admissions officers and they have to review the applicants, two applicants to give them a, a scholarship. And so we've collected all this background information of what these kids have posted and they have to go through it and decide if they were making that decision, who would they give the scholarship to? So just doing those games and playing, doing those scenarios and discussing it, they remember those lessons, you know, and hopefully yeah, yeah. when they go online, they, oh yeah, I remembered that I learned that. So I'm going to be a little more careful about what I post online. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You have a great term in your book, uh, this concept of over sharenting. Um, can you explain that? Because you kind of, you mentioned yeah. some, the the, what, what the concept is, but talk a little bit about that and why it's a problem for kids. Yeah. Well, that's when parents or grandparents or well-meaning relatives post a lot about their children. Um, and when they do that, you know, that becomes part of that child's digital reputation. And as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of kids, I hear it. They're like, I'm so embarrassed. Like my grandma put this picture and now people see it. And it's like, what do I do? I mean, that's distressing. And so I just think it's courtesy 
for all of us, no matter if it's a child, adult, friend, you know, if you're going to post something about somebody, just ask ahead of time, like, are you okay with this? And, you know, if they are posted, if they're not be respectful, I've done that with my kids since they were little, you know, and to this day, they're both in their twenties and they still don't let me post anything about them. <laughs> and I, I respect that, you know, it's their yeah. reputation and I want to be respectful as they ask me and there's things I don't want them to post. So I just think as human beings, you know, that's a really easy way to be respectful of one another's privacy. Yeah. Plus that shows that's good modeling too, as a parent, if you are, yeah. if you're showing that respect for your kids, cause we've crossed over, our kids are you know, 19 and 21 and, and they don't like stuff being shared without them knowing. And, uh, right. and it is a good, it's a, it's a good way to show them this. You have to show people digital respect, uh, the same exactly. way that you want them to show digital respect to other folks when they're posting. Right. Exactly. So before we jump into some questions about kids and online financial activities, we have to talk about this. This is the art of allowance project, um, uh, podcast. And I just want to ask you kind of, uh, just to get into, get ourselves rolling here. How did you teach your kids about money? And importantly, what I'd love to know is how, and, and that we, in this show, Diana, we get fairly granular. So if you want to talk about like we started allowance or we didn't, or we, you know, they started businesses, whatever, that information is really helpful, I think, for our, the parents who are listening. But I also want to know how you introduced them to money and technology um, and digital money once you got to that point. Yeah. Uh, you know, before I jump into that, because there's a lot to yeah. talk about, I just want to say, I don't feel like my husband and I did a great job because my my kids now in their 20s, they're, they always tell me, and they, they're college educated, you know, and they're like, what, why did no one ever teach me about taxes or, you know, st the stock market? Like, why did I not get classes in this? And I think that's another great failing of education. You know, these are practical skills that every person needs. And so I'm still helping them. I mean, I spent a day with my daughter helping her with her taxes helping her sign up for you know health insurance, helping her car insurance, you know, all the little financial things that are so important, but you know, they still need my help with it because no one ever really walked them through the steps. So yep. I'm not a great role model when it comes to that kind of parental <laughs> education, honestly. But yeah, but you're a great role model in the sense that you opened up a conversation with your kids yeah. so that they can have that conversation, yeah. you know, and even if, I mean, we're all, we're all parents. This is all an experiment. We're trying to figure out how to do this. Nobody told us how to do it. And we're all kind of carrying around whatever shame it might be about mm -hmm. things we wish we had done better. But the only thing we can do now is share the things we wish we had done better in a way that the parents who are listening can do a better job raising their kids, right? So right. Um, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, it's a, a day doesn't go by that I don't think, oh gosh, I wish I had done that. When I, I have these conversations about money with so, with so many money experts and parents, and so, I mean, in every conversation, I think, oh, what a great idea. I wish my kids were younger so we could yeah. implement I that idea. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so with, with that as a backdrop, um, I would just love to know, you know, anything about the process that you went through that you feel comfortable talking about in terms of kind of getting them started. And then to the extent that you did trans transitioning them to the digital money side and how you helped protect them as they started to work in the kind of digital domain. Yeah. So that, that is really a big emphasis, not only in my parenting, but what has translated into our curriculum is just mm. what do you share online and what do you not share online? And a, a, a lot of purpose, not only because of your reputation and all that, but there's a lot of scammers online. There's a lot of ways that you can lose money or give money away online. And that starts very young. I mean, that's just, we do online safety 101. And I pulled it up just because all of this applies to money. You know, we teach the kids never share any personal information online, your birthday, your social security number, your phone number, none of that. Yep. Keep an eye out for emails that look strange and unfamiliar. Don't respond to text messages from numbers you don't know. Never click or open attachments from unknown emails or phone numbers. Be suspicious of incredible online bargains or sales. Pay attention to your feelings. Practice skepticism. Always think twice before you accept an offer that seems too good to be true. I mean, th those are really basic starting points for keeping your information safe. And then 
you know, we can go deep, more deeply into the kind of schemes that kids are getting drawn into because it's, this is a big issue. Kids are, teenagers are the number one target for scammers that are looking to try to make a buck online. And that's because they are a great market because they share, share, share all the time without yeah. thinking. And a lot of them fall into these traps. So I would love to talk about those. Please go deeper. Go deeper. Okay. Well, the first one I wanted to talk about is it's uncomfortable for parents to think about, but it is a really important thing to know about. And that's sextortion. Mm. The reason I bring that up is you probably know this. The FBI issued a warning last year, sextortion schemes, particularly targeted at teenage boys. And what it work, how the way it works is usually someone will have a relationship with somebody on some online platform. It could be a gaming app. It could be Instagram. It could be Snapchat somewhere. And they'll have like that, this little flirtation. And then that flirtation will, they'll say, Hey, let's move to a more private place. Maybe a Google hangout discord somewhere. And then perhaps that person will send some, you know, half naked picture and say, Hey, will you share some pictures of yourself? And in, in some really sad cases, um, you know, kids have turned around and sent those pictures. And then all of a sudden that person says, Hey, I've got these nude pictures of you and I'm going to share it with everybody in your address book that I was able to access, unless you send me an Amazon gift card and you got to send it in 24 hours. Or... So that's how these schemes work. They're yeah. financial schemes. And often the people perpetrating that are not even in the country. They're offshore. So it's really hard to track them down. But I bring that up because that's like worst case scenario, but it happens. And I mean, there were two cases last year where this happened to teenage boys and the teenage boys were so humiliated and they were too embarrassed to tell a parent or an adult and they mm -hmm. committed suicide. Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's freaking tragic. I mean, the fact that there was not an adult in their life they could turn to, or that they felt like they'd done something wrong. You know, this, these are sophisticated schemes targeting teens. So I just, it's something we talked about in our curriculum because I want every teen to be savvy to it and to be really careful who they befriend online. Yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, I, I didn't realize how big of a deal that was. And I appreciate you sharing that. And especially the, the financial side of what's going yeah, on. Yeah. It's a money scheme. Yeah, yeah. 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 So where are teens most vul or most vulnerable online outside of that regarding kind of banking and financial activities? Yeah. So that's, you know, again, that's a very, even though there's this warning from the FBI, this does not happen like every day. Although I will say in the kids that I've taught, I often ask how many of you have been approached by a stranger online and half the class hands go up. So wow. we are getting approached by strangers in different ways. So, you know, this is the elemental thing to have a child know is don't share personal information. And then this is also important because kids love to share their passwords with each other because then they can mm -hmm. check into their, each other's accounts. They think it's fun. That is another big no, no, because passwords, that is our first line of protection for financial information, for banking information. So we never want to share our passwords with anybody except a parent. So that's another, another big thing. And then a lot of times what kids are getting targeted with are in their social media apps. There's like online shopping scams, or maybe there's a fun survey and you fill that out. And while filling it out, you're divulging personal information. So there's all these little schemes that are, you know, trying to tap into things that they think teens will find fun to try to extract as much personal information as they can. So you know, yeah. go through what those are and the warning things for kids to look out for so that they don't fall for those traps. Yeah. I mean, there are even programs that are you know, trying to educate kids about financial education through paying them to be financially educated. And it begs the question, I'm like, is that, are you teaching them to be financially educated or are you teaching them to game the system to win whatever prizes there are? Because we know how savvy teens are about figuring out this stuff uh, uh, in order to get to the end goal without having to cross <laughs> through right. the, uh, through the, through effort, the effort part that might be. Required. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, are there any other areas, any other kind of key areas that you think parents need to know about for teens just regarding banking or financial activities? You've covered a lot, but just want to make sure we've covered every uh, potential aspect here. Yeah. I pulled up a couple in the curriculum that we teach kids about that oh, I'll just yeah. kind of extrapolate here if that's okay. But two sure. of the big ones that um, are targeted at teens right now, online shopping scams. 
This is when a scammer creates an online ad or store that claimed to sell cheap designer goods, electronic gadgets, and other popular items. Sometimes they product they offer or imitations, and after paying for them, consumers may not get what they hope for or may not get anything at all. So that's something that teens are falling for. They see a little thing on Instagram shop here, and it looks awesome, and it's not really what they were hoping for, and then they don't, you know, what do they do? And the other one are these online influencer scams. Teens love influencers. There's a lot of them online. Sometimes a scammer creates a fake social media account that looks like that of an influencer or celebrity. They might even stage an online contest and ask the winner to pay a fee or to provide their bank account number in order to get their prize. Mm. So that's something else that's happening. So, you know, for kids to be aware, you never give your bank account information online. I mean, you just, you just don't do it. So, you know, it's, they make these things easy and fun and, you know, enticing and just for kids to be taught like, Hey, warning, 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 don't do this. So we teach them that. And then we have a whole bunch of scenarios that they play out in class because there's so many different ways that people can get to them. So we play out typical scenarios that might happen to a teenager and we give them a red flag or a green flag, you know, is this okay or not okay? And they talk about that. So it's a great way for them to practice these skills. And again, hopefully remember them if it ever happens to them online. Well, that is all really helpful. I appreciate that, Diana. We, you talked a little bit about um, the importance of not sharing passwords, but what are some other best practices for teens that we may not have covered to protect their personal and financial information in the digital world? Well, passwords, any kind of, you know, addresses is a big one. You know, you don't share your address, birth date. Um, and then another one that we didn't talk about is just knowing how to make a good password. I mean, that's another thing. Passwords, again, are our first line of protection. And, you know, kids will use the same password on everything or use a really easy password to guess. And so we we play a game where they use a mnemonic to help them remember a great password. It's really fun, but it teaches them, like, you know, all the elements that go into a good password and why. And yeah. so that's another pretty easy thing that even a parent could teach. Yeah, that is, that's very helpful. It's, it's, it's funny. Cause I, I, I'm just thinking about my kids. Uh, <laughs> I know when they log into their computer, it's just, they take their finger and just go right across the, the keys in the front. And that's so many of them have that kind of login. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. that is not going to protect. It's easy out. for people to guess. I mean, that's the thing, like a lot of, you know, these, sophisticated schemes will have like programs where they just go through and they try the most typical passwords until they get in. So that's the reason why we do uppercase, lowercase letter symbol, you know, this many things change it every six months. Yeah. And it's made fairly easy because it's built into a lot of the device. You know, if you have a yeah. phone, you can right. easily create your own passwords, right? It's just yeah. a matter of getting it across to them, how important it is to have right. those passwords. Right. And two factor yeah. authentication, why that's important, yeah. what that is, what it does. That's something else we talk about. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So a lot of times, not only do you have to choose a strong password, but a lot of companies will say, do you want to set up two factor authentic authentication? <laughs> I'm going to struggle with that word today. <laughs> and so basically what that means is that not only do you put in a password, but to make sure it's you they'll often send you a text with another number that you have to put in to get into your account. And it seems like, oh my gosh, what a hassle of a step, but that's just another layer of protection that's really important to take, especially for anything that involves money, your bank account, any kind of financial website. Yeah, that is all really helpful. Appreciate it, Diana, thank you. Are there any other risks of oversharing personal information online that we haven't covered? and? what we can do as parents to help them, to guide them to avoid it. Because, you know, I, I think one of the other issues is just that, you know, as parents, we are you know, we're telling dad jokes, we make cringy observations and our kids are <laughs> ignoring us. Even when, you know, sometimes we're just being annoying, but other times we're talking to them about really important things like this oversharing can affect your online reputation and those risks really do matter. And for kids, you know, they just, it's all of us have a difficult time thinking about, you know, being future focused. Yeah. We're very much in the moment and that's, that's a good thing on some level, but we have to be aware of how this might affect us down the road. So what else can we do to help our kids um, avoid oversharing? Well, you kind of hit the nail on the head because as a parent to tell your kids not to do something, 
it's going to go in one ear and out the other. It just is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially with technology, because a lot of them say, well, what do you know? I know so much more. It's just right. the mindset. So that's why I just think doing these activities in the classroom with peers and saying, hey, what do you think? You figure this out. It empowers them to feel like they are the expert and they make this discovery on their own of what could happen. And all of a sudden they feel like, oh, wow, this is what you know, I'm going to be more careful because I did this activity and now it's in my brain. And then they turn around and they're the expert. And oftentimes they go home and tell their parent, hey, you shouldn't do this because this could happen to you. So yeah. I like to turn the equation around. It's funny. In the beginning, you said something about engaging students and empowering parents, right? Is that what you, yeah. the term you use? And I would turn it around. Like, I think what we're trying to do is empower the students and engage the parents. Hmm. Interesting. I, for yeah, this, what, what I was talking about was for that that's what we do. So we engage kids to get them excited about money smarts, right? And then we empower the yeah. parents to help raise them to be money smart. So I like yeah. your reframing. Continue, Diana. Well, I think for technology, we have to do it this way because parents don't know enough, honestly. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> again, it's new to, new to most parents, relatively new, not so much as it used to be, but it's still evolving and it's not something... You know, for some reason, kids are just adept at technology. They know the latest things because they're on it all the time, you know. And so we have to empower them with their own skills. And then I, I say engaging the parents because within the curriculum, we have these send home parent letters that have activities that families do together. And parents often learn a lot through that. And it engages them to talk to their kids about all these things, which is so important because as I relayed that really sad story earlier, you know, those two poor boys didn't feel like they had a parent they could tell, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so we want to engage parents so that when and if something bad does happen, you're the first place they go. I mean, that's yeah. so important. Yeah. And what you're, you're kind of getting at the, what really underpins all of what we do as well, which is that we, we call it the art of allowance project and art of allowance, uh, podcast, but really you could call it the art of conversation or money conversation in this case, right. uh, tech or media conversation. We had that conversation with Aaron. It is all about keeping that, keeping those lines of communication open so that, you know, we don't get into a situation where they, they feel like they can't have that, that, that conversation or they, they feel alone exactly. and they don't know what to do in a situation that's as right. dire as what happened to those uh, teenage boys, which is awful. You've got some really uh, interesting activities. You've already shared a bunch of them uh, from your book, Raising Humans in a Digital World. We will definitely have a link to that in the show notes because I think, if nothing else, that is the guide the parents can turn to. Uh, your website is also replete with lots of great activities and ideas. It's a great, that's a great starting point uh, too. Are there any other kind of activities that uh, you can think of kind of off the top of your mind uh, that you would like to share based on what we've been talking about that might be useful for a parent um, to kind of start this process or engage with the process? Man, there's so many. I'm just going to go off the top of my head because one thing you mentioned early on was digital reputation. And so I always think it's fun for families to do this, but, you know, sit with your kid and Google yourself and see what comes up and see if it matches the person that you believe you are in real life and have your child Google themselves or Google a friend or family member and see what comes up. So I just think for, you know, that's something you can do together. It's fun, you know, and you might learn like, oh gosh, they shouldn't have posted that. Or that's exactly what they're like. That's so cool. They post that. It's, it's a, it's a nice, easy activity to understand digital reputation. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because when I was uh, reading through your book, I did exactly that. I put down the book and I Google myself and then I Google my kids and uh, I was like, okay, that's, that's not bad. That's, uh, that's, yeah. uh, that's all, that's all workable. Yeah. It's funny what comes up too. You're like, wow, I did that so long ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I would say one of the, one of the things we did well as parents is we have, our kids have original enough names. Cause my name, John, part of the reason we gave our kids more uh, kind of different names was that I remember being in a math class in high school and having eight other Johns and thinking, you know what? I don't want my kid to have to deal with that. And so when we Google their name and you know, our last name Lanza is not that common a name, their names appear at the top. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, which, which actually underscores the importance of making sure that your online reputation is really good because 
you're going to pop to the top. So it better right. be pretty solid. Exactly. So Diana, before we go through the gauntlet, that is the fast and fun round here at the Art of Allowance podcast. Is there anything else you want to cover with regard to kind of kids and tech and money that we didn't discuss that you feel like, oh, we have to let parents know about this? You know, I would just circle back to what I said at the beginning is like all of this is education, you know, and it's not I mean, we covered a lot of things and none of that could be done in like a one hour assembly in a school or a one hour lecture from an adult. It's things that kids kind of have to discover when they're developmentally ready and practice and play out and discuss and just, you know, put up, chew it up and understand it. And it takes time. And we just, I mean, as far as what digital literacy entails, we covered this much of it, which is a tiny, tiny amount. Um, yeah. You know, it just it takes time and meeting kids where they are developmentally is really important. Yeah. Well, I think you hit on a key point, which is that what we're trying to do here is we've got financial literacy, we've got media literacy, and we've got digital literacy. And all three of those things really matter. It matter as much as literacy itself, you know, uh, reading right. and writing. So um, yeah. I think this is, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm excited to have to share this conversation because it all seems to work together because you can't have financial literacy anymore without media no. and digital literacy, right? Yeah, because we do everything online. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's just part of the world today is how we've evolved as humans. Yeah. I modified the first question um, that we normally ask. So what does the term, let's say, let's say digitally empowered mean to you, Diana? Yeah, so I love that because I think Empowered is the word we want to focus on. We want to empower our kids to use technology safely, wisely, ethically. And we can do that, but we have to educate them on all the things that that entails. Everything from digital reputation, cyberbullying, hate speech, plagiarism, sextortion, online information, misinformation, disinformation. <laughs> Shall I go on? So it's a lot. Um, but you do all that stuff and then they're empowered because they have all this knowledge that they can use. And then use the internet in a really wonderful, empowering, productive way. Yeah. And, and we're, and we're, we're kind of now you know, wading into this world of AI where misinformation, disinformation, yeah, whatever you want to call it. That is one. To become, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is going to be something they're going to have to sort through. And that's hard. I mean, that's hard if you are fairly media literate, I can only imagine yep. as you're kind of growing and trying to figure all this out. Yeah. But digital empowerment is a goal, and I think that's good, and I appreciate you sharing that information. So, so Diana, what is the best investment of time or money you've ever spent on your kids? Well, I thought about that, and I think the best investment on my kids' time and money-wise <laughs> was, you know, every summer we're really intentional about doing a big trip together into the back country mules take us back there and dump us there for like a week to 10 days and we love it because we're completely you know there's no cell coverage there's no internet we have to have face-to-face -face communications 24 7 you know we don't do that in anymore in the world right especially yeah, as your yeah. kids get older so i think that the investment of doing that from the time they were babies till now that was a great time investment. And I say money because it's, you know, it does a vacation. It costs money. So I think it was a really great investment that we made into our children. Well, that's wonderful. And like I said before, I always get these ideas that I think, oh, I wish I had thought of that idea for our kids <laughs> when they were younger. So um, that's wonderful. All right. So, Diana, if you could transmit a message that everyone would see, skywritten, on a billboard, <laughs> wherever, what would that message say? Well, I think it would be the way I ended my book. My advice to people, whether you're online or offline, be good, be kind, be happy. Pretty simple. Mm, that's a great billboard. And then other than your own book, which we will, like I said, link to <laughs> in the show notes, what's kind of one book, podcast, and you could share more than one uh, podcast or any media that you go back to or that you gift or share the most often? Well, one book that I've gifted a lot, it really is written by my mentor, Michelle Borba, who really helped me when I was writing my own book. And she wrote a really thoughtful book. Um, it's kind of a long title, Unselfie, Raising Empathetic Kids in an All About Me World. And it's really 
like I talked about ethical thinking, how important that is, but empathy is really important today too. And her book is all about how to raise kids that have a lot of empathy. Um, I think that's a very key book. And I, I've given that to a lot of friends. Oh, very nice. Yeah, we we didn't really talk a lot about that in this particular conversation. I know there's a lot in your book on that. So if parents want to find out more, your book is, has got a ton of information on the importance of empathy. So how can people find you to the extent you want to? There's a certain irony in this, find you on social media, but we're talking about, we're talking about parents here, um, find you on social media and or the web. Well, I'm easy to find via both my websites, cybercivics.com or cyberwise.org. I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, Diana Graber. And then we're very active on social media, both cybercivics and cyberwise. We're on all of them, Facebook, Instagram unfortunately X, but you know, we do them all. So we're easy to find. And then I can be reached through our support line anytime support at cybercivics.com. Very nice. And is there any action that you'd like people to take that would be helpful to you or cyber civics? Yeah. You know, it's what I said earlier. I mean, if any of this resonates with you and you want your kids to use the internet well, whether it's for financial purposes or engagement purposes or learning purposes, or just because they're going to use it when they get older, you know, pick up the phone and ask your school administrator, are you teaching my kids digital literacy? You know, and if you're not, why not? Um, I think that's really important today because it doesn't happen unless you ask for a lot of schools. A lot of schools are doing it, which is awesome. Um, I would hope that you would send them to cyber civics if they want to learn more. We have a really robust curriculum that starts in fourth grade. It goes through eighth grade. So at the very minimum, that's what I would love for parents to do. Well, very nice. Uh, Diana, this was great. I appreciate you connecting and telling, talking to us and helping parents to get more digitally empowered. Really appreciate your time and all your knowledge. So thanks again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me.